This explanation is probably going to be the most important one for you to understand what is the nature of spasticity, what is the nature of the movement disorders, what is the nature of the troubles with posture, functional development, and so on, and so on in a very straightforward manner. Now, first of all, we're going to start with these basics. These are the types of pictures that you've seen uh, endless, hundreds amount, hundreds of times. So these are the illustrations of how the movement works. All right, so this example is the one that shows the arrows for the extension and the flexion of the elbow. And then, of course, you can easily visualize that when this demonstration shows you the extension, there's going to be the accentuation of the triceps, which does the work of extending the elbow. So it contracts here, and then the biceps respectively lengthens on the front. And then when the elbow bends, you would get the image of the biceps itself getting to shorten and the triceps to expand. So that's a typical illustration and a typical explanation of the movement. Now, once you got the muscles into the mix, then, of course, the next thing that goes in is the explanation. Okay, you've got the muscle. In order for the muscle to contract, it has to receive a signal from the brain, and then the signal travels to the motor unit, so from the motor cortex to the motor unit, and respectively, that's how the whole thing works. And if the person has a brain injury, then there would be so-called motor lesion and all sorts of the expected wrongness in the way how the brain controls the muscle. So that's a standard narrative that you're going to get absolutely everywhere, which has two parts. One part is the basic biomechanics of the joint movement, and in fact, the basic kind of functional anatomy of the joint movement representation. And the second part would be the neuromuscular control. So that's really what you get as the basic explanation, and that's what you also easily connect and link yourself. So, yeah, the muscles of my child, they don't feel right, so they must be true. And when uh, my child wants to get some movement, it doesn't really work this way, so it must be true what is happening there. So uh, that's the basis, and well, nobody's going to argue with this basis, but we would. Right? So we would for a simple reason. But if I erase all this and go back to this picture, see what does this picture show? This picture puts the emphasis on what's happening inside the joint between the bones. Whilst, in fact, the same picture, you also see that there is the skin. And the skin, when you look at any type of movement, particularly here at deflection, it's not difficult to visualize that actually before you get any reaction of the joint, or in the same time you get any reaction of, joint, of the joint, there is this folding that happens within the skin. So, in other words, you cannot really just talk about the movement itself. You have to understand that whatever happens at the joint, or technically speaking at the articulation, so that is wrapped around in the context of the skin. Now, this is not new for you if you follow me for any period of time. And of course, the next thing that you anticipate is to see this video from Jean-Claude Gouberto, which is showing you how the things work and that the muscle fiber is actually dependent on the stability provided by the controls that I call the muscle control sandwich, because that muscle control sandwich includes the stable part, the stabilizing, the restricting stationary part, which would be the skin. And then, of course, then you've got the displacement of the muscle, which is embedded into thousands and thousands of fibers. And then you also get the same type of relationship with the skin of the bone, which is just having a special name of the periosteum. So, which has exactly the same thing. So, the muscle is then trapped between the two sides of this sandwich. And then, unless the two are stable enough, the control of the contents of the sandwich are not possible. So, that's also something that you have heard from me before. But there is one thing which is really missing and which is really important to realize. That's to understand this entire mechanics in a more tangible and kind of numerical way. Let's try to understand what's going on there. 
See, this is the angular movement. So it's angular. Angular, so it goes like this, right? You see, that's why you've got those arrows. So you see, in other words, you've got the, you've got the pivot. And here, there's a measurement of the angle, which goes there. So when we look at the control of the angular movements, we have to look in a bit more detail. So when we are engaging the skin. Because everything that we have for the movement, for example, of the elbow, if we look for the range of motion of the elbow, so it's going to tell you something like this. So 130 to 154. So roughly speaking, if we add this up, so that's going to be about 150 degrees total. So we are actually looking at the things at a very, very much face value thing. Looking at the elbow, for example, mobility here, not too early with this demo, we have to arrive there. So I'm looking at the mobility, where there's the mobility of the shoulder, where there's the mobility of the elbow. I'm going to look at it from this simple perspective. So the thing that we're going to look at is what happens at the skin, right? And what are the numbers, what are the numerical things there? It's a very simple thing. We just saw the mobility of the elbow. Okay, so that's just a more realistic image that I quickly found, because usually, you know, for those demonstrations, you find the bones. So, well, for example, this is the illustration of the elbow. So what's my very simple message? Say, look, we look at this at face value. This is the space where the joint movement is taking place. So this is going to be the total of 150 degrees, but it goes along the joint left so i'm going to be generous and say look here we have about one centimeter let's say half an inch so in order to control this what you need to have you need to have the corresponding layout of the centimeters within the skin and that's how it looks like this is the key image see what i'm showing here the good skin is the skin that has angular control. See, if you look here, I am doing the movement of the skin. Now, let's measure it. See, now this skin is looking out, so sort of perpendicular to the bones, right? Across the bones. And then I start rotating it. See, as I rotate it, this same skin now looks downwards. So it was looking up towards me. Now that same point on the skin is looking downwards. So it has been a 90 degrees rotation. But the other thing is that the same skin has to roll the other way by respective 90 degrees. And if I take the next roll, which is slightly lower, it has to be exactly the same thing. So, in fact, when we discuss the mobility of this one centimeter at an elbow, we need to provide the corresponding one centimeter distances all the way through. And then, let's say if here we have one centimeter, and let's say that's a 20 centimeter long forearm, and then the 20 centimeter long upper arm, which has exactly the same thing. So, you want to do the numbers? So for each of those, 20, you're going to have 90 degrees down for the skin and 90 degrees up. Together, every centimeter in this cross-section has 180 degrees. But there's 20 centimeters up and 20 centimeters down. So we have to multiply, right? Don't be scared of the zeros, but this is it. So 180 times 40, that's 70 to 100 degrees. Now, remember, we just talked about the fact that the total mobility which is allowed by this centimeter is about 150 degrees. So we already see that the skin, in order to have 150 degrees mobility, you already see that we need 7200 degrees of stability just across. But then if you look at the cross section of the arm, so because the same lines, of the same type of the angular stability should be along the skin. So I'll be approximately on the same 
line and average it has 20 centimeters circumference across so we'll get another 20 centimeters which have to be multiplied by 180 so that gives us 36 hundred degrees right so I add them up my total here is going to be 10,800 degrees and for this purpose I haven't even discussed the fact that the skin has seven layers or more each of those is supposed to have this level of degrees I haven't discussed that actually one centimeter is a very crude measurement the reality is going to be you know a lot more frequent so these degrees are going to multiply multiply but it doesn't matter so what matters is that this simple thing if you want 150 degrees of mobility in the elbow they have to be backed up by at least 10,800 degrees of skin stability skin stability above and below then if you do have this right and you see the ratio here it's well it's short of 100 but roughly you can see that this is going to be 50 times more well actually if you were, we're going to be very specific that's going to be like 70 times more so there is the total capacity for the stability is 70 times the mobility so if your child is not moving his elbow what's the cause of this it's very simple it's not neuromuscular it's skin based simply if your child doesn't have these divisions yet if the skin is too flat if the skin is too slippery see that's why i'm returning you to this image right this image is great but it doesn't convey this idea of the angularity of the additional angularity but the reality is that each of those displacements is like those semicircles that's how it's working one way and then for the return the other way right and that's it so in other words in order to have the muscle displacement which is going to be responsible for 150 degrees of the joint mobility now you need to have correspondingly 70 times more the stability distribution through everything that comes from the skin and deeper from the bone which is actually stabilizing the thing and that's really the answer to your question like what do you need to do to make my child's arm torso whatever more mobile it's that it's the recreation of this map and that is true not only for the hand this is equally true for the torso because you see here on the torso we can see exactly the same thing the skin has angular properties see i do these rotations the skin has angular properties it has to have this angular stability every centimeter you can see what's important there if it has this angular stability then you see the person from the outside is trying to pull the skin it doesn't work well i should say it doesn't work anymore because before it was working before we restored that angular stability well it was just the skin without divisions it was one single layered skin so therefore well she didn't have any mobility at the back or the torso simply because there was no backing of the skin so that is a very very important and yet simple message to have all these measurements they only make sense of this famed 150 degrees of mobility if you have the preliminary skin map that silently and quietly backs it up with 10,500 degrees so that's the relationship that you're actually looking for that's what and how it works and that's why what do we offer you we offer you all sorts of the tools to get this skin stability factor activated so that's the reason why the ABR fascia gel works, for example. So we do this and we feed the stimulus. So we improve the angular connections between the skin and the muscle. And then that contributes to the mobility. 
but it doesn't contribute. We don't actually try to force mobility, right? We are looking at the improvement of the stability. So that's a very, very important thing to understand, right? Is that in order to, so you see for every degree of mobility, putting it simply, you need to have 70, or in reality, 100 degrees, 100x of the stability. So that is a very, very simple thing. So that's why stretching and so on doesn't work. Because you're trying to force, if you're trying to force more here, if you don't keep this 1 to 70, or let's say 1 to 100 ratio, you're never going to get it. So it's, if you see that your child's arm is not moving, you have to ask yourself a question. It's not what's wrong with the joint, why it's not moving, but it's the question, okay, it's very simple. That means that this 1 degree of mobility, 1 degree of this kind of affordability is not there, because the stability of the skin behind it is not working. And that's, again, whether it's the torso or whether it's the arms or legs, it's the same thing. So it's the same type of the relationship, the same type of the response, the same type of everything. You see, that's angular thing. Skin has this angular structure. And then, of course, here on the abdomen, this would be seen very, very clearly, so as the formation of those folds. So that is an illustration of the angular structure of the skin, which is completely defining what happens at the joint and what happens then to the muscles.